Hey everyone, this is Will, and welcome to this brand new and exciting episode of The Missing Piece. When the world is still watching the war in Ukraine and also the ongoing political and the economic battle between China and the United States of America, one country recently hit the news headline. Again, too often, we tend to ignore or undermine the power of North Korea. However, the more we watch and the more we follow regarding this political and also this economic attention within this country, that it seems like the questions are never answered. So that's why today it's crucial that we need to understand this ongoing political tension between the South and the North at this moment, and also for the year of 2022, when and how measure we should take today in order to stop this nuclear weapon development and the missile test in North Korea. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to invite Dr. Rudiger Frank. Now, Dr. Frank is a professor of East Asian Economy and a Society, and he's the head of the Department of East Asian Studies at the University of Vienna. And in 1991 and 1992, he spent one semester as a language student at Kim Il-sung University in Pyongyang and has been researching North Korea ever since. Dr. Frank, and welcome to The Missing Piece. Hello, and thanks for having me. No problem, the pleasure's all mine. Now, Dr. Frank, again, as I mentioned in the intro, for so long that North Korea <clears throat> is strategically located in Asia and... As we are paying attention to the war in Ukraine, but recently the missile test has been more repetitive in this country and the neighboring country, South Korea, the current president or the even what or should I say the newly elected president send out these harsh tones to punish what North Korea has done. So the first question to you, Dr. Frank, how should we understand the reason behavior of North Korea, and why do you think this repetitive missile test can be seen as a major threat, not only to South Korea, but also to the world? Well, I think this is a, I need to give you a multi-dimensional answer here. So one aspect of this is pretty long-term. North Korea has, for whatever reasons, decided that it does need to have the capacity to have nuclear weapons and to deliver them, for which you need missiles. And, um, well, if once you make that decision, obviously you need to test these kind of things, especially if you build them domestically, if you cannot really rely on importing them. So, on one hand, this uh, staccato of missile tests is purely technical in the sense that, you know, for weapons development. The other thing is, indeed, the situation in Ukraine. And, um, obviously, many countries have been rethinking their security policy they have been looking uh, inward at you know the uh, position of the military they have been looking at the military supply chains and everything and countries like north korea um there are a few more um they also reconsidered their own geopolitical situation in a way and north korea for last 30 years has been relatively isolated i don't want to say they were standing completely uh, alone but almost um, I'm old enough to remember a time when we had the Cold War mm. in the 1980s, where a country like North Korea has been safely part of a camp. And then suddenly, in the early 1990s, this changed for them, which I guess for most uh, of us now is kind of a normal state of affairs. But again, mm. if your time horizon is a bit longer, it was an extraordinary situation. And this extraordinary period has now come to an end. So we are seeing the formation of two antagonistic blocks again in the world. And uh, North Korea can uh, expect to be comfortably part of one of these blocks, which uh, gives them lots of more options actually than they used to have in the past. And uh, I would say that this uh, missile testing is of course also related to that, both to the uh, threat emanating from all these question marks, you know, uh, about Ukraine, what does it mean? How will other countries react? Will they probably try to try something else? But also this newly found freedom as being part of a camp and not having to care much about what the Western world thinks. Um, so, yeah, in, in a nutshell, that would be my more superficial analysis of this mm. situation. Dr. Frank, again, I want to read something to you. This came out of an article, again, as I mentioned before, 
newly elected leader in South Korea, again, compared with his predecessors, Moon Jae in remember Moon Jae in he actually had multiple meetings and set down conversation with the sitting North Korean leader, Kim Jong Un. But after this election took place, this new person, the new kid on the block, that began to send out this harsh and critical attitude toward this North Korean leader. And during the recent speech, and again, along with allies, South Korean government believe that putting harsh effort towards North Korean government could be the necessary step to avoid major disaster to the international community. But in return, this is what the North Korean government said, and I quote, if the South Korean regime and military reefing and think about confronting us militarily, that they can neutralize or destroy some of the parts of our military forces preemptively by resorting or some special military means and method, they are grossly mistaken. And again, Dr. Frank, we have heard similar rhetoric before from the North Korea. So my next question to you is, Today, in the year of 2022, when we look at this globalization, when we look at this political instability, how much should we take the rhetoric from North Korea seriously? So in other words, do you think it's so threatening or so anxious that we need to pay attention to the rhetoric from the North Korean government? Oh, I actually think that like in, in I'd say 95% of all cases, you should take what they say really seriously because very often they just say exactly what they mean but what what did they say i mean it's not like they said uh, we are going to invade south korea tomorrow they said if you attack us first then we will strike back mm. and frankly i don't understand all the excitement about that i mean isn't that like the most the most natural reaction mm. by any country in the world saying that if you attack us we will attack back don't think we are weak. Don't think we are. We will just stand by and hope that you will somehow magically re retreat or something. And this is what they've been saying all the time. That's what they've been saying about their nuclear program as well. They never really said we are going to use this to conquer the world or to reunify Korea or to drive the Americans out of East Asia or whatever. They always said um, we, in more general terms, we need that for self-defense and then in times of higher tension, they said, well, if you dare invading our territory even by an inch or something, then we will mercilessly strike back. So, yes, of course they mean it. Um, do we have to worry about it? No. Not as long as we do not intend to invade the North Koreans. I mean, in that case, we should be worried, but I don't think anybody has that uh, in intention. So all they try to say is stay away from us. Leave us alone and everything's going to be fine. Well, Dr. Frank, again, as I mentioned something in the intro, again, from your bio, back in 1991 and 1992, you actually spent good amount of years in Pyongyang as a student. Now, we know that back in the days, even still today, when we look at this North Korean government, we believe it's a family dynasty, you know, from the grandfather to the father and to the son. And also, I remember back in 2018, when I was visiting Pyongyang for the first time, I still remember that picture that people idolize the family, idolize Kim Jong-un, you know, again, put in, the real, in a, a more religious term, it's really the god for the country. So my next question to you is, fast forward, compare with back in the days when the grandfather or even the father was in control, compare with what the son is actually doing today. What changed this country? And that's the first question. And the second question is, some people call it this missile test, this nuclear weapon development for the country. It's actually a suicide mission for the country because it's just making this country more isolated from rest of the world so what can we make of that well maybe i can answer the last question first sure. um i think that was a donald trump quote right mm. um, rocket man is on a suicide mission or that's something. right um, <laughs> um no i i think it's exactly the opposite right now and this is what i referred to earlier um, North Korea is now much less isolated than it used to be, mm. and um, especially due to its relationship with Russia and China. 
And these two countries, they have everything that North Korea needs in terms of external partnership. The Russians have all the oil and the gas and the natural resources that North Korea doesn't have. I mean, they have a lot, but they do not have oil and gas, mm. which are crucial. Uh, China has the uh, t technology and all the consumer goods and all the intermediary goods that North Korea needs for its industry. Both countries have huge markets that North Korea would need uh, potentially for um, exporting its uh, goods, products and services. Services in a way also including um, uh, laborers, for, for example, labor force. So um, um, the North Koreans are less isolated. I think they are now less worried about um, sanctions and about you know, whether the rest of the world wants to deal with them or not, they are now also less worried about financial sanctions, which have been pretty heavy and also very effective since 2005. The Banco Delta Asia issue, I don't know whether you remember, mm. that, was a, that was a major strike actually where banks stopped cooperating with North Korea out of fear that they would be blacklisted by the United States. Um, on the question of how much North Korea has changed ever since the days of Kim Il-sung, and that's when I was there first, in 1991, Kim Il Sung was still in power, like the founder and the grandfather of the, the founder of the country, and the grandfather of the current leader. And I actually attended in February 1992 the 50th birthday celebration in an indoor stadium of Kim Kim Jong Il, uh, together with a few thousand other people. So it wasn't like in a small room, mm. um, but still, um, yeah, these were very different times, I must say. Um, especially because Kim Jong-il, like the, the second Kim or the father of the current leader, he was actually a man who tried to have some reforms or let's say changes in North Korea that had not been there before. Um, he was he, he was a younger man, let me put it like this way. You know, he was the son who inherited the family business, uh, traveled to China in 90, uh, 1983 and uh, observed, you know, the early days of the reforms under De Deng Xiaoping there. As a result, uh, we had the first joint venture law in North Korea already issued in 1984. They also played around with something like consumer good production, which is not very typical for uh, state socialist countries. They're usually focused on uh, producer goods with the so-called August 3rd goods. That's a movement that still exists in North Korea where uh, larger industries are also required to produce um, consumer goods made out of, you know, leftover parts, etc. as kind of a sideline business. Um, Kim Jong-il was the one who um, had to lead his country through the major famine of the mid to late 1990s, mm. which of course has been caused primarily by the inefficient state socialist uh, economy of North Korea. But it was triggered uh, by the fact that the Russians stopped delivering oil at friendship prices. And oil was a crucial input for North Korea's agriculture um, in the form of fertilizer and the form of uh, fuel for agricultural machinery and so on and so on. And as a result of that, uh, they resorted to giving a bit more freedom to people to fend for themselves, which would then lead to what we could call marketization. Kim Jong-il was the one who oversaw the July measures of 2002, which were, I think, the most far-reaching and comprehensive reform efforts so far in North Korea's economy. Um, that all coincided, unfortunately, with 9-11 mm. and um, the subsequent uh, much harsher security policy by the United States. North Korea felt uh, much more threatened by that. Um, we had in uh, October 2002 uh, the second uh, nuclear conflict breaking out with the United States. The first one in 1994 agreed framework was kind of resolved, but in 2002 in October uh, the whole thing started again. And ever since actually things were going south. For a few years North Korea was still sticking to its economic reform policy. Well, I'm, I'm having difficulties calling it a reform policy because it was not really in the very sense of the word, but mm. at least they had more of a semi-marketized economy elements in their economy, let me put it this way. They had something like North Korean Chebol emerging, you know, the uh, South Korean con conglomerates are called Chebol after the Japanese term Zaibatsu. And in North Korea, we had something similar where you had 
businesses that were very closely connected to the states but de facto operated semi-privately mm. uh, strongly diversified uh, one example would be air choreo for example that we know as the airline of the country but they also produce soft drinks they produce cigarettes and they pro and they operate uh, gas stations and they operate taxis so it's a, it's one of these typical cases um and this has changed north korea society substantially and i would say to a point where there is no return possible. So when I was there in 1991, if I may tell you that story, because I think it's very illustrative of what mm. has changed. Um, I wanted to purchase a coffee cup in the department store number one in North Korea. And I went there and I saw a huge pile of coffee cups, uh, actually more than a hundred. And I mm. pointed them and told the comrade saleswoman that I would please want to buy one of these coffee cups. And she said, we have no coffee cups. And I thought, well, you know, maybe my Korean wasn't good enough. So I reformulated. Mm -hmm. No, I wouldn't get the coffee cup because they were there just for decoration. They were not for, for sale. Mm -hmm. And they had no interest in selling in anything because in a state operated economy, selling, you know, it's, it's not, it doesn't mean profit and economic success. It just is a, is a burden. Because if you have an empty space in the shell, it needs to be refilled or otherwise the leader will be unhappy if he comes along and sees an empty shelf. Uh, a few years later, t 10 years later or so, in the mid to early 2000s, I was in North Korea again and I saw signs actually offering discounts on products, you know, to get people into the shops to actually buy something. And they would be totally happy taking your dollar, Deutschmark or whatever you had, mm. euros at that time. To me, in 1991, even U.S. dollars or Deutschmark wouldn't do the trick for me. They were just not interested. Fifteen years later, they would do whatever they could to get hold of my uh, hard currency. And uh, you can imagine what that does to the life and thinking of people, mm -hmm. where suddenly you have a monetization of an economy that before had almost existed without really being based on money. It was more on availability, access, uh, if you wanted something, money would be a necessary component, but it wouldn't really be all all it takes. Mm. That sounds totally alien to most of us. I mean, we are used to a world where if you just have enough money, you can That's right. get almost anything, right? In North Korea, it was not like that, but now they are like this. So mm. they are now more like us, which means it's something you don't even notice if you visit because you consider that to be so normal. Mm. But um, myself, having seen a North Korea that was totally different, I noticed that change, and that is absolutely massive. Mm. It, it changes the outlook of people on their lives, on how they, how they desire their own career and their life path, and how they try to, you know, make their children pick the right educational path or something. It creates new ambitions. It creates new power relations within society. You suddenly have people who do have money and mm. where kind of power emerges out of being rich. I guess in the media, you read a lot about the donju or masters of money. That's one of these terms that they have for these newly emerging mm. North Korean capitalists or, or something. And that has really changed a lot. Kim, Kim Jong-un himself, what was his contribution to this? Um, well, at least he didn't stop it. Mm. I mean, he came to power relatively surprisingly in late 2011. That's right. Um, he was pretty young at that time. Um, in 2012, we saw a few measures that could count as a hopeful sign towards him being like a young, dynamic, Western-educated, reform-minded person. But no, I think he was more like a conservative man in the sense that he continued what his father had started, but he didn't really significantly expand mm. it. And then since uh, 2016, uh, we see actually, or 17, we see a move backwards. So mm. what we see right now in North Korea is a Kim Jong-un who tries to turn back the wheel of time to the 1980s, undo or um, yeah, at least stop most of these marketization measures re-establish the power of the state in the economy um, and uh, re-establish the power of the um, economy-related ministries, um, turn back also all these ideological changes that have happened, uh, focus on import substitution rather than on export promotion mm -hmm. and so on. So that's the situation right now. 
Dr. Frank, again, I'm very glad that you mentioned something. It's so crucial and that actually can help me to ask the next question. When we look at the U.S. today, inflation has become a major crisis. I mean, look at the economy in the U.S. today. Every single person is very much concerned about the word economy or put in a simple way, which means money. On the other hand, people always believe and also saying that under Kim Jong-un, economy, it also matters to the people and also to the government at this moment. So help us to understand, according to what you said, if Kim Jong-un's plan or a, a strategy is to roll back this society or roll back the clock and turn it back to the 80s, but don't you think that the, the, the economy already is on the brink uh, on the brink of collapse? I mean, if we, I just say, if we're going backwards, how could he afford to build his credibility if the economy is being stagnant or if the economy is in turmoil. So in other words, what are the strategies today for Kim Jong-un to continue his family's legacy and also strengthen his credibility in order to counter the major political and also economic threat from the West and also from other countries help us understand dr frank maybe i can start with a side note what we do see now in the global economy is what i call the jucheization of the global uh, economy in a way mm. juche being the north korean ideology which as one of its component has a focus on economic independence and autarky i mean if you if you look around yourself uh, i mean i'm here in europe we now talk about um, bringing back the supply chain to Europe, which means ending trade with the outside world or reducing it, uh, producing many things by ourselves, even if that's at the higher cost, because we understand that the safety of supply might be more important than cost efficiency and so on. And I keep thinking, oh, yeah, you know, that's what the North Koreans have been promoting for 70 years. And we've been laughing about them for very good reasons and pointing fingers and saying, hey, guys, this is not how you build an efficient mm. economy. And now we basically do the same thing. Um, no, but back, back, to your, back to your question. Um, and in a way, I think you asked me that before. I just uh, failed to answer it. Um, maybe I can do that, uh, combine this now. Sure. It, it's related to how the North Korean system works. I mean, if you look at it, it's, it, is a, it is a poor country. It is a country with many, many issues. Um, with an abysmal human rights record where, uh, you know, you have um, camps for political prisoners, you have hardly any individual political freedom, where people live under very harsh economic conditions, where we, I mean, it's not like we have a major famine every year, but people are definitely malnourished, undernourished mm. countries, very often on the brink of starvation and um, you have this huge gap between Pyongyang and the rest of the country and so on, right? So we know all that. And North Korea is surrounded by such uh, economic success models like South Korea, Japan, and also China. That's right. And you think, how is it possible that this system still exists? And the answer is, obviously, their top priority is not the economy. It's as simple as that. And when I say mm. there... I'm talking about uh, the uh, North Korean people, most of them. Mm. The um, ideological, uh, in the uh, isolation, in a way, and the um, almost perfect information monopoly of the state, combined with Korea's history, they made it possible that many North Koreans, and I know what I'm talking about since I know many of them, many of them prioritize national independence sovereignty mm. over the economy. It's not like they don't care about the economy. Of, of course they do. I mean, they're human beings like you and me. Right. And they all want to live well. But it's not like their top priority. It's maybe it's the number two priority. But number one priority is what you could call uh, patriotism, nationalism, and all the rest of it. And um, this is something that I think has been a little bit disregarded under Kim Jong-il. And Kim Jong-un is returning to it. Why? Because this is what he can deliver. Mm. You know, if he if he tries to compete with South Korea, and let's face it, I mean, it's a divided country. So, of course, the other part is always the main competitor, whether you officially admit it or not. If you want to compete with South Korea on economic terms, 
come on, North Korea doesn't have a chance. Mm. So why why should they then? Why do, that's why they they have chosen a field where they are more competitive. And that is nationalism. The North Koreans have an, an easy time pointing at South Korea and say, "Hey, you guys, you have American troops on your territory. Mm. We have no foreign troops on your territory." So he who is the real independence fighter here on the Korean Peninsula? It's mm. us. You are the running dogs of the Americans. And it's really difficult for South Korea to defend against that. Of course, right. it's not it's not true in that way, but they do have American troops on their territory, right? And uh, that's why the North Koreans, by the way, are always a little bit torn between supporting and being unhappy about South Korea's uh, very tough relationship with the Japanese, because this is something that both Koreas share, you know, strong skepticism against Japan, uh, having been the colonial power until 1945. Um, so in that way, the South Koreans can a little bit compete with the North Koreans. But otherwise, no, it's really, it's na it's the nation ideology independence first. And then comes this whole narrative about Kim Il-sung being the uh, liberator of the country from the Japanese, being the defender of the country against the Americans, and Kim Jong-il being his right-hand man and uh, therefore also his only legitimate successor and then kim jong-un also kind of following up in this line mm. and that's where they get their legitimacy from um if you live in a democracy le political legitimacy is usually process-based so you have an election and you win it and then even those who don't like you they kind of accept okay he won the election he's going to be our ruler until you know we have the next election right now you have a country like north korea where you do not have this process-based le legitimacy so the legitimacy of the political leadership necessarily is performance-based. Mm. And again, performance is not the economy because that's where they are unable to compete. Mm. What they try to and relatively success, successfully try to use as performance is keeping the country strong and independent. And that's why much of the rhetoric that we very often understand as being directed at us we, you know, the West, the outside mm. world, much of that is actually for domestic purposes to reassure the population that, hey, our leadership is doing a good job. Mm. Um, we might be living a poor life in terms of, you know, food and everything, but hey, look at these strong weapons we have. Mm. And these weapons, they will defend us. They will guarantee our independence. They will make sure that neither the Americans nor the Chinese nor the Japanese will invade us and uh, take away our Koreanness and force us to speak their language mm. and uh, force our women into prostitution and our men into forced labor. You know, all these references to, to the past that Korea has uh, gone through. Mm. And um, I think this is important to understand if we try to understand why North Korea as a state still exists and why it seems to be relatively solid. Well, Ladies and gentlemen, I'm speaking to Dr. Ruger Frank. And Dr. Frank is a professor of East Asian Economy and Society. He's the head of the Department of East Asian Studies at the University of Vienna. And again, in 2019, uh, 91 and 2092, he spent one semester as a language student at Kim Il sung University in Pyongyang and has been researching North Korea ever since. Dr. Frank, it's been a pleasure speaking to you and thank you so much for taking your time to join the show. And we love to keep in touch with you and have you back on the show as we continue to follow and also pay attention to the political and also uh, social and agricultural uh, development in North Korea. Thank you, Dr. Frank. Thank you very much. Pleasure.